So welcome again to Arrow Architectural number 19. Delighted you're here. Thank you for being here. And here we go. So today we have two programs. We have a mini and a maxi. We get so many phone calls from people wishing to speak that I'm starting to add pieces to our main presentations because the content is so valuable. We often have focus group meetings with our Arrow Architectural folks. The number one thing they ask for is education in terms of architecture, which our second program today addresses. And they also want education about particular neighborhoods in Los Angeles, which is what our first, our mini presentation will handle today. It gives me a great deal of, of pleasure to introduce our first speakers, who are right down there in front of me. Welcome. I'm going to be completely honest. I was never that enamored, and I never paid attention to downtown. The truth is I thought it was awful, and I avoided it. And that was until a couple of years ago, when I drove down there and I saw improvement, and I, of course, put the grocery store in, which I think heralded you know, a turn as far as residential living downtown. But the best part was when I saw our speakers a year ago, and I visited with, with uh, Suzanne first, and uh, let me get to my correct notes here. I visited with award-winning interior designer, Suzanne First, and she and I go back 27 years. She was once the president of the American Society of Interior Designers in Los Angeles chapter, and I always come to a fine job, so welcome and thank you. And Suzanne teamed up with her partner, who's also here speaking, a marketing and branding expert, Robert Nieto. He's a newer friend of mine. And what they did was they teamed up and they created a company called Collaborative House, and it completely changed downtown as I knew it, and most likely as you know it today. And in just eight minutes, and it's the mini part, they're going to give you an inspiring look at what those two are doing, and in turn, dramatically increasing the value of condos downtown. I had no idea. It's absolutely amazing and astonishing what they're doing. So please give a very warm welcome to Suzanne First and Robert Nieto. Thank you. Thank you. I hope we live up to your expectations. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today, we'd like to discuss a positive way in which architecture and design is reshaping downtown Los Angeles. And uh, we wanted to start with a little bit of information which some of us may know and some of us will learn today. Um, we have been working on projects in downtown LA that have been beneficial to its rebirth over the last few years. And we would like to share them with you today and we hope that they will inspire you as well. The city of LA, as you know, is exciting and diverse. It's the second largest city encompassing the most ethnically diverse population in the country. It is a leading world center of business, entertainment, international trade, culture, media, fashion, science, sports, technology, and education. And it actually has been ranked the third richest city in the United States and the fifth richest city in the world. As the home base of Hollywood LA is also known as the entertainment capital of the world as we all know. Downtown Los Angeles has become a vibrant city center thanks to its commercial, creative, and cultural rebirth. Today, many people live, work, and play there and can experience world-class arts, entertainment, dining, and nightlife. Unfortunately, Los Angeles has the dark side. We have the highest density of homeless population in the country. According to the Institute for the Study of Homelessness, and the poverty of the Weingart Center, an estimated 254,000 men, women, and children uh, live homeless on the streets of our city. Approximately 82,000 people are homeless on any given night in our city. I wanted to share some recent statistics with you because I think that a lot of us have preconceived notions of what homelessness is, um, and I, want, I thought that this was very enlightening. But the average age of a homeless person is 40 years old. Of this, an estimated 20% are physically disabled beings. 41% of these homeless adults were employed within the last year, which is a big figure. 16 to 20% of homeless people are currently employed, but they have no place to live. 25% uh, of all of the homeless in our city are mentally ill. A sad one is that 
of, of these homeless are military veterans that have just come back from the war. But this one is really striking to us. 48% graduated from high school. A surprising indication that homelessness is not due to lack of education. Today, what we're going to do is share with you how design and architecture is influencing the homeless as well as our community. And Suzanne first will take over as our permanent designer. Thank you, Robert and Brad. So, as we have just said, that that LA is long we, we has long been regarded, you know, the um, the city of the future. But it also has the most original and innovative architecture, reflecting the diversity and imagination of the people who live here. On this slide is a remarkable building, the Star Apartments, designed by Michael Maltzen. It is his third project for the Skid Row Housing Trust and is planned to be completed this spring of 2013. This building is unique in how it is constructed and designed. It will incorporate its existing one-story structure at its foundation and its core and provide shops, community spaces, and supportive services for both its residents and the community at large. Above this podium, you can see the prefabricated apartments there. Sorry. They have... Um, <laughs> they are geometrically stacked and define recreational spaces and courtyards, making it the first modularly constructed multi-unit mixed-use residential building in Los Angeles. We lead with this photo because the star has been both dynamic and exciting and a first in LA sure to create a new avenue in the design and construction of future projects. Remarkably, the stunning building is not the expensive high-style condominium that you would expect on first glance, but rather a new permanent home for many people now living on the streets. As you will see in our presentation, the symbiosis of architecture and design and permanent supportive housing creates an intimate harmony between the structures and the lives of their new residents. We have just been privileged to work on projects such as these, with some of the most iconic architects in the city, such as Michael Maltzen, Koenig Eisenberg, and Kilifer Flamin, among others, who have ta created a talented work in this concept. And what is this concept, we ask? It is geared on the idea that high design matters to everyone, including the homeless. The architects of these new and restored buildings not only complement the streetscape <coughs> of the community, they generate a new dynamic for the residents who will be living in them by giving them a sense of hope for a second chance. This is accomplished through breaking the psychological barrier of hopelessness caused by the drab institutional soul-depleting previously built government-subsidized housing projects and replacing these buildings with state-of-the-art, highly designed structures that not only benefit and inspire the residents, they enhance the streetscape and provide a positive visual experience for the entire community. And you can see how diverse these buildings are. Some of them are also being planned. While nothing can deflate the NIMBY protests that inevitably accompany socialized housing, it is hard to protest the presence of buildings with the caliber of architectural design like the ones on the slide. Here you can see how they create a wow factor for the community as a whole and hold their own alongside new condominiums selling for $500,000 and above. These buildings are located throughout the downtown area and weave into the fabric of the city. Our formula for these projects is to complement and integrate the architect's vision into the design of the interior spaces and courtyards to create harmony and a sense of home. We have used warm, vibrant, and inviting color palettes as well as comfortable and stylish furnishing for the apartments, community spaces, offices, interior and exterior courtyards. They are designed to beckon a sense of security and belonging and encourage the tenants to socialize with each other and give them the desire to recreate their lives with a purpose. In summary, you will be happy to note that everyone benefits from this concept in the city. Studies show that a homeless person now costs taxpayers 
$65,000 a year due to the necessary provision of temporary services <coughs> such as emergency health care, public safety, <coughs> incarceration, and temporary shelter costs. However, by providing permanent housing, taxpayers' costs are decreased to approximately $30,000 per year per resident, quite a savings, I would say. We must educate the community in understanding that nimbyism is not the appropriate route in eradicating homelessness. <coughs> Through the accomplishments of developers, architects, designers, and social services for these projects, we can create a positive outcome by actually reducing homelessness through the provision of permanent housing that beautifies and improves not only people's <coughs> lives, but also contributes to the redevelopment of our city, benefiting taxpayers. We are happy to have been able to share this exciting new and innovative formula. We hope that you will agree and help us to support and promote this positive and much needed way to eradicate homelessness one building at a time. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. But as far as a realtor, it's invaluable to know the information they just presented. When I saw them several months ago, and we had lunch and visited and whatnot, I thought this is the perfect information that is so important to get out there. And I think downtown is changing, so thank you. I, I love that you're doing uh, invaluable, vital work. It's, it's very encouraging. Um, Susie and Robert will be available during lunch, so uh, please uh, feel free to visit with them. I know they'd love to talk to you. Thank you again. I now have the privilege of introducing our Maxi program, starring architect Tim Barber. Tim, as you'll find out, is an extremely likable person immediately. During our May uh, Aero Architectural, uh, as I said earlier, during our May Aero Architectural planning meetings, the number one topic to, is, that's requested is to learn about what good residential architecture really is. You're in for an irreverent treat this morning with Tim. Tim Barber Limited, his company's name, was founded in 1994 and now has 14 design stars among his group. The company's award-winning work appears in nearly every single Southern California neighborhood. And a special thanks this morning go to not only Tim, who's a former ICAA, which is the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art. He's a former president, but special thanks this morning also to his wonderful assistant, Mary Kate Spock, who's here this morning, as she uh, was uh, instrumental in this morning's program and is the head of his business development department. So please give a very warm welcome to Tim Barber, who is somewhere here. And most of all, thanks to you for giving up your Monday morning. It's, uh, it's been a long journey to get here, and I have a ton of stuff to show you, so we're going to go fairly quickly. I hope you can keep up. Um, I'm about to talk about a mission that's very, very personal to me. I spent the last 18 years working to make the city of Los Angeles more beautiful. It's one of the most diverse, imaginative cities on the planet, but its architecture is some of the worst. <laughs> Fixing this city is, in my mind, an architectural emergency. My firm designs new homes and also renovations of existing homes, so it makes me really, really mad when I see architecture done really badly. And I get really excited when I see it done really well. So today, I will try to share my vision of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Okay, I know we've all been there. It's in the development straight out of that episode of Weeds. Uh, what's, what's that suburb called? Uh, aggressive. Think of a sea of pink stucco houses, all <laughs> rippling with those interesting roofs, windows that are way too small for the house, and boy, oh boy, a double garage door that takes over the front of the house. Or maybe it's the Guinness record holder for the largest house on the smallest lot. <laughs> or maybe it's the designer's dream flipper for all those granite countertops. It's your job to sell it. I feel your pain. <laughs> I'm not here to be an architectural snob, 
But in a lecture about good architecture, I'm going to have to touch on, call it compromise architecture. Oh, hell, just call it bad architecture. <laughs> Why is it bad? That's what I want to talk about. We all know good architecture when we see it, but what's the recipe for good architecture? How did it get that way? Can bad architecture go to reform school? I want to talk about that too. If we know why it's good, we can design it better, build it better, and sell it better. And knowing why it's bad is either heartbreaking or just catty fun. <laughs> so why do we need to know this? Self-defense. <laughs> Buyers and sellers are significantly more enlightened than any time in my career. For one, through Zemus, Redfin, Google Maps, they can learn as much about a property online as I can. Two, in my business, a smart client is way more fun and less work. They're eager for a deep understanding before buying a property, and they're willing to do the legwork. And three, they're going to test you. So does teaching them pay off? You bet. A buyer wants to love the house they come to see. They want it to be good. And if they, they think it isn't, they'll turn into Sherlock Holmes or that guy from TMZ. <laughs> An informed buyer will appreciate the good schools or the CCNRs or the HPOZ. Your buyer wants to know that they're getting wiring on a roof that will last. If the seller knows about beautiful life effects, they can help schedule showings for those moments when she's ready for a close-up. <laughs> for example, Brett sold a house recently that featured carved alabaster panels in the dining room windows. At around 4 p.m. every day, the light came beaming through those panels, filling the room with this golden glow. Knowing one unique detail such as this could sell a house in an instant, he scheduled a twilight open house. It was a great success. If the seller knows the best and worst features of the house they're selling, they'll be way more realistic about the sell price. If there are really good features to brag about, the seller will need to rely less on the potpourri, and incoming buyers will respect the selling agent more. If the house is energy efficient, or could become energy efficient, it's worth more. And this next one may be hard for you to hear, but sellers and buyers need to understand the value of the historic elements of a house when deciding to keep them or alter them. I'll frequently take a meeting with a broker and a client to discuss what could be done with a beautiful old fixer and what it might cost. Sometimes the buyer's plans would so compromise the historic integrity of a good house, I tell them, this isn't the right house for you, get back in the car. <clears throat> when an agent understands what's worth changing and what's going too far, <laughs> they can help their buyer see the merits of preservation. And many times, Preservation raises the value of a home. But sometimes tearing down an ugly, dysfunctional house is an act of mercy. <clears throat> the more we know about what makes good architecture, the easier it is to defend it. And the more we know about bad architecture, the quicker we can call it a teardown. So what makes good architecture? In the first century AD, the architect Vitruvius wrote that good architecture must be strong, useful, and beautiful. Now nobody's really arguing about strength and utility, but in Los Angeles, one man's palace is another man's future tennis court. So we'll go down the trail of architectural principles for answers we can use. For architecture to be strong, it must be durable. Our most enduring buildings know how to dance with earthquakes using reinforced concrete, steel, even wood in flexible ways to keep the house on its foundation and the roof and windows in place. Uh, okay, not like this. Most of us know, but in our older buildings, we often got it right. We used simple, effective methods. This is a full concrete stem wall. These walls are poured concrete all the way from the basement to the ceiling. This is a wood frame shear wall. They keep the house level in an earthquake. These are attic and crawl space vents. They keep the building well ventilated so a water leak doesn't become a mold farm. In our newer buildings, we get it right in many ways. This is a steel moment frame. They use smaller steel posts and beams instead of large wood shear walls, allowing us to create larger openings while still staying strong. This is rot-resistant man-made lumber. Because we overcut our old growth forest, we can't easily get rot-resistant lumber. So we make our own. Buildings endure when the materials are authentic 
and they suit their purpose. Think about simple stucco instead of foam moldings. Terracotta tile instead of plaster tile. Bricks instead of brick stamp concrete. Wood instead of wood print melamine. Tile instead of printed sheet vinyl. Glass instead of plexiglass. Solid brass hardware instead of brass plated. You know what I mean. Buildings endure at the cost and effort to maintain them is reasonable. We replace the worn out parts of the building if it's designed to let us. So what makes a building easy to maintain? A good building has adequate electrical service, tight end copper pipe, ABS sewer lines that don't crush or rust, shower pans that have hot mop and not PVC, paint with a last coat brush instead of spray. When do we see a house and know that the maintenance will be hard? Look for sheet vinyl flooring, shake a like roofing that crumbles when you step on it, galvanized pipes, wood countertops, and melody surfacing. Buildings endure if they suit the climate. Stucco resists our heat and our brush fires. Slate and tile roofs resist sun and rain and pests. Crawl spaces keep a building healthy if they are dry and clean. Doors and windows endure if they are waterproof. This is a window pan. You want one, because without it, you get this. This is a properly wrapped window opening. You want that too. This is an interlocking door threshold. And this is weather stripping. For architecture to be useful, it must be functional and adaptable. So let's talk about function. It's the architect's job to create a space that functions well. And when it doesn't, it gets really mad. It, you've been in plenty of houses where there's terrible flow. What are some of the symptoms of bad flow? Well, a bad house has no doors to the rear yard. The front hall might lead through the kitchen to the living room. We recently worked on a home where the master bedroom had been accessed through the master toilet room. Sometimes, the builder clearly assumed that any inhabitants would be Francisca Moss. So a two-by-two-foot two closet just about covers your storage options. <laughs> Good architecture accounts for storage. It leaves space for the Halloween decorations, the out-of-season coats, and all that booty from your first wedding. Can we remedy this? You bet. We can find places for built-in storage, hidden storage, and full walls of storage. We can use space in the attic. We can build a basement under a house. Kitchen cabinets can reach the ceiling. You can get a staff so they're really good for your glutes. <laughs> good architecture is adaptable to change. In my lifetime, I've watched the beginnings of cell phones, the internet and fax transmission. I've watched the endings of a party line, a landline, eight track tapes, and tube television. In the last 100 years, buildings have changed from accommodating all kinds of service staff to accommodating DIY, laundry equipment, dishwasher, Whole house vacuums, hot and cold water filters, microwaves, steam showers, electric blankets. What's my point? In the next hundred years, our buildings will need to accommodate climate change, cyber terrorism, water <coughs> conservation, recycling, wireless money transactions. So get ready. Homes will change. Now, good architecture also deals with sound. Ancient theaters had to address the issues of sound because, well, there weren't any body mics or speakers. Architects addressed acoustics and residential architecture in the same way. Think about it. When reading a book in the living room, we shouldn't be hearing our sons Malcolm in the middle marathon. Conversely, when we're having a few friends over, we want the piano to resound throughout the house. Traffic noise, schools, construction noise, a neighbor's dog, teenagers at the detention can all be addressed by architecture if it's done right. If it isn't, can we fix it? You bet. Some outside tactics include side walls, berms, fences, trees and shrubs. We can control inside noise with low E laminated glass, soundproofing in the walls and ceilings, using elements to soak up sound, like texture, paneling, bookcases, and also simply by placing the private rooms in areas away from the noise. There are good architectural remedies for excessive noise you can show your buyers. Not all of them are expensive. Let's take low-e laminated glass. 
As opposed to dual pane glass, slowly laminated glass consists of two pieces of eight inch glass fused together with a sheet of ultraviolet reflecting film between those pieces. It's nearly as energy efficient as dual pane glass, and it's even better at bouncing sound back. It can be used to replace the thin glass in old historic windows, even in those beautiful steel casement windows we find in so many 20s and 30s houses. My office recently replaced the window glass in the head of school residence across from Marlboro School, and suddenly we were unable to hear all that joyful noise. Knowing how a building can control sound will come in very handy when showing a buyer that house on a busy street. <clears throat> Good architecture is also adaptable to climate. How many of you try to show houses in the early morning and most of the buyer won't notice that the south side of the house is roasting in the afternoon? Maybe the architect didn't take the climate and the house's orientation into account when designing that home. So how does good architecture take advantage of climate? In Southern California, most of our logical buildings soak up daytime heat for slow release in your cool nights. They shade us from our blistering sun in outdoor spaces, and they capture the prevailing breezes. They keep us warm in our winter without wasting energy. They use our sun to generate power with solar heat or photovoltaic collectors. They capture and reuse our paltry rainfall. Their trees and their plantings scrub our polluted air and store carbon and retain stormwater runoff. Building codes for new homes have clear and stringent requirements. Codes for renovating existing homes are catching up, but we already can address issues like this in a house that's already been poorly built. Where massive panes of glass just drown that house in heat, we can add a pergola like this one. We can plant shade trees on the south and west sides of the house, or replace windows with low laminated glass. Yes, I'm pitching it again. It's, uh, it's deflecting that UV ray while Bucky sound. This is awesome. We can add windows or transoms or fresh doors on the windward side to catch prevailing breezes. Did your buyer know that cool air descends the slope at night? Or how cold air moves in from the ocean after sunset? If you're selling a home that lacks a good orientation, use that compass app on your phone to pinpoint north and south and suggest adding a porch or windows or extending a house in a direction that can take advantage of our gorgeous climate. I can't talk about climate without also talking about hardscape. Extensive hardscape isn't just ugly. It reflects way too much heat. It sends dirty water to the beach, and it chokes off the water from planting areas. Can we improve upon that? You bet. We can remove unneeded hardscape, or better yet, replace needed hardscape with materials that have water through, like pervious concrete, soft set bricks, paving stones, or gravel. These cool a house, grow the garden, and heal the planet. Speaking of healing the planet, I want to touch on the green features that can help us use our climate to be energy efficient. Uh, I grew up in the 70s. Back then, even shading was considered wasteful. We saved gas, laundry soap, our old jeans. But it wasn't easy being green. Now, when building a new ground of the house, it's easy to incorporate green features like cisterns that catch rainwater or gray water tanks that collect and filter the water from our showers and washing machines to water our gardens. My office just completed our first lead gold-rated new home where we use both of those water-saving techniques. We also use reclaimed wood, healthy paints and carpet, and LED lighting. But often, my firm undertakes historic and old house restoration projects. While those buildings may be well-designed, they don't yet possess new green features. Can we fix that? You bet. We can retrofit older buildings with everything from photovoltaic shingles. You can barely tell, but all over the front of that roof are these individual solar collecting shingles that provide power to the house. We can use tankless water heaters, insulation, low flow plumbing fixtures to preserve water and energy and to take advantage of our unique climate. We're currently working on a restoration of the indoor pool at the Jumpman Club downtown, where we're adding LED lighting to all the coffers to provide ambient light with very, very low power requirements. We can educate our buyers on the benefits of saving energy, even here in Los Angeles, and saving money and saving our environment. We can teach them how to sell power back to the grid and how to get terrific tax incentives. Okay, finally, for architecture to be good, 
good, it must be beautiful. There are many ingredients in the beauty recipe. Are you ready? Here's a list. Beautiful architecture is well proportioned. It suits its context. It has color and texture. It makes elegant use of natural light. And it's symbolic of its culture. I know that's a mouthful, so let's break it down. What is proportion and why do we care? Now, I know you've seen something like this before. Those skinny little columns and that big fat porch on top of it. Or this. Again, skinny little columns, no porch at all, and giant windows. Or this, huge moldings on a small one-story house. What we are reacting to is disproportion. What is perfectly proportion? Well, we are. We are a completely narcissistic species. In this diagram drawn by Leonardo da Vinci, we see that he's analyzed the parts of man. We decide on what's beautiful for ourselves based on the proportions of our own bodies. Eyes to nose, arms to legs, hands to feet. Architecture has similar rules of proportion. Take these exteriors. <clears throat> this house is way too big for its life. These windows can either be too small or, in this case, too big for the house. The columns can be too fat and too short for the giant architrave or way too tall. Getting it wrong feels weak, unstable, dangerous, uncomfortable, and pretentious. OK, now look at these exteriors. <clears throat> Getting it right feels strong, balanced, serene, inviting, and safe. Can you fix the bad ones? You bet. The remedy for a house that's too big for its lot is either to tear apart it down or buy the lots on the two houses next door. <laughs> Can we fix a roof that's too big? Make thicker columns? On the inside, good architecture requires the width of the room to be proportionate to its height. In the Renaissance, the architect Palladio dictated that the height of the room be no less than the width and the length be no more than twice the width. Today, we want the height to be about two-thirds the width. A 12-foot wide room needs a ceiling at least eight feet high. If it's 15 feet wide, that ceiling's got to be at least 10 feet high. Take this interior picture. The ceiling is really low for this room. The tall doors only emphasize the low ceiling. Can we fix it? You bet. When there's an attic above, we can raise the ceiling. We can reduce the openings. Yes, you heard it. Even in a room with a view, sometimes reducing the openings improves the room and enhances the view. Or if the room is on the first floor where a low ceiling can be raised, we can add texture, we can align the views, we can lower the window sills, and drop the floor, all to improve the room's proportions. When height is what we need, we can improve with a variety of ceiling degrees. A tray ceiling, like this one, or a cathedral ceiling, a tent ceiling, a groin ball to the ceiling, you get the picture. But we can't raise the ceiling disproportionately. The effect is, well, we've all seen it, it's, it's a house ruined by one or two rooms made so big that they make every other space seem dumpy. Now, there's much, much more, more to know about proportion. Formulas for proportion were described as far back as the Epic of Gilgamesh. Can I show hands here? Who read Epic of Gilgamesh in high school? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, some of you know I'm currently the education chair for the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art. So here's my plug. This national organization teaches the history and the science and the technology of classical architecture as the basis for good architecture of any age. So if you want to know more about proportion, talk to me later. So let's talk about context. Good architecture knows its place. It fits into the context of its surroundings. Its height, materials, style, color, texture, light, and orientation complement the nearby buildings and the street, streetscape. Bad architecture strives to radically interrupt the sequence, to be its neighbors, or shock the visitor. Now, this is the opposite of saying that buildings of different styles can't live together in perfect harmony. Variety is good. 
The contemporary building complements the scale and reflectance of its older neighbor. Same thing can happen in housing. Like you would at a dinner party if you were sober. I have <clears throat> got to talk about color and texture. Texture in architecture comes in many forms. The way a house captures light and shadow and absorbs and deflects noise provide texture. A beautiful home has many textures. Smooth, shingled, shiny, weathered, carved, mossy, corrugated, patinated, translucent, transparent, thatched, colorful, ornate, ribbed. An awkward home has few of these qualities. Good architecture might have a sheltered front door, walkways with enough texture to be safe, but not too much, bookcases or paneling, sometimes glass art, or interesting hardware, or pattern in tile or brick. Could we create these if the builder didn't? You bet. So now let's turn to light, natural and artificial. A beautiful home has a magnificent natural light all day long. In great Southern California homes, light is in theater. Deep porches face south and west where the light is most abundant. The living and dining rooms should get late afternoon light, and master bedrooms should get early morning light. All bedrooms should have good light. All bathrooms should have windows. Gray homes make special light of changing seasons, allowing winter's low slanting sunbeams to reach deep into the home while deflecting summer's harshest light. Light coming from different directions has different color tones. I like to say in Southern California, most often light coming from the north has a blue cast. Light coming from the south has a yellow cast. Light coming from the east has a green cast, and light coming from the, or the west has an orange cast. The most enjoyable challenge of my job is finding light. I've been known to put windows between rooms and windows on the ceiling. I don't use many skylights, but I prefer to use clear story windows, or dormers, or cupolas. Now, this is a study where the entire panel ceiling goes up in a pyramid shape to a cupola that lets light in from all four sides, which keeps the light diffused all day long without that big shaft of bright light that would make, make it impossible to work in there. At night, thoughtful homes have light layers, including task lights, decorative <coughs> light, and ambient light. Workspaces have a strong diffuse light. Restful spaces might have indirect light. Baths should have light strong enough for shading. Yes, I know, it's not go right now, but it'll come back. A window in a shower can make magical light. Closets provide enough light to tell navy blue and black. Rooms with many windows and no window coverings eat up light at night. And rooms with many mirrors exaggerate light. OK. I know I freaked you out earlier when I was threatening to talk about symbolism, but I'm serious. A beautiful home makes a statement. The most common form for housing in the United States has a Greek temple front porch. With its raised steps, triangular pediment, and tapering columns, it clearly announces that this is a sacred space. But there are distinctions to be made. A Doric column is masculine in simplicity, even military. An Ionic column is womanly. A Corinthian column is rich and imaginative. What other symbols do we find in architecture and what do they mean? But when the lower parts of the building are rusticated, the building is strong and gorgeous. A sunburst or an arch over a door gives a hero's welcome. A dome represents heavens. A picture window says, you may look in. A porch says, come sit a spell. Urns indicate respect for our ancestors. In Southern California, many garages dominate the street frontage tell us that driving away is more important than coming home. <laughs> a high hedge or fence is a symbol for the state, no matter how small the property. A cook's kitchen is a sure sign of hospitality, even when no cooking is done there. A spa bath guarantees that the owner is a sitterite, even when they're texting from the toilet. <laughs> Things change over time. The fragrance of fresh baked cookies used to mean happy home year, but now they mean do I smell old? <laughs> Music in the year used to mean cultured owner lives here, but now it means 
Can I hear the 405 from here? Chad Carpenter used to mean trailer trash was here, and the finale means I'll bet those floors are in perfect condition. <laughs> and lastly, great homes have a soul. It's why I love them. In good architecture, all day long, you can appreciate the authentic materials and skilled craftsmanship that made them. These homes encourage connection with our beautiful planet, our elders, our children, and our dreams. I, I can't emphasize this enough. We dream because we've been fed and loved and taught. As architects, builders, realtors, designers, and artisans, we have an opportunity to uplift the human spirit simply by building the best we can. And by teaching those who follow in our footsteps how to know the value of it. I also mean back in terms of product. Good architecture is an easier sell when we know why it's good. But it's really bad is how it makes us think and speak and act. And when the buyer calls us a few years later with a larger family looking to trade up, they'll remember the higher standards and guidance that we gave them. How would your life be different if all the buildings on your steps were really, really good? Think about it. But not too long, because it's an emergency. Time is wasting. Thank you very much. I want to give a special shout out to architects Eric Evans, Mark Appleton, Gil Schaefer, and Calder Law, photographers Karen Millay, Bar Hall, Jean Marnasso, Clark Dunner, and Noah Webb for sharing some of the photos that you've seen today. Thank you.